Hello, innovators. I'm Todd Wyant, and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast presented by Applied Software. You're invited to join our MEP and construction innovation adventure with the mission to propel this great industry forward. And we have made it. It's the final day of MEP Force 2021. And so <laughs> to celebrate, we're sort of getting the band back together one last time. Uh, and there's it's down to just two of us right now. <laughs> welcome, Jake. <laughs> That's uh, it's the it's a little band, a little band. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, uh, all you need. <laughs> we'll do a reunion tour later, I guess, <laughs> with the full crew. But thanks for being part of it again. Happy to be here, Todd. Uh, so, a couple stats about the the conference as we're we're wrapping up our our third and final day here. We had about a, a thousand people join us at some point throughout the the three days and the live stream and the the block parties, coming from forty states. 15 countries and six continents. So Antarctica gave us no love, but every other continent had somebody come, which is pretty cool. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah. yeah I, I was mean, uh, shocked to see that world map light up. As much as we all love our in-person conferences, you know, those stats wouldn't have been possible um, unless you did a virtual conference. So hats off to you guys. Yeah. But hopefully uh, next year we're done with these virtual conferences and we can be <laughs> yeah. back in person. <laughs> I'll second that. Uh, <laughs> In-person conferences are are stressful, but man, virtual is it's a whole other ball game. It's a di- stressful in a different way, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, let's start off in a different order today. We're gonna go from the end of the day and work our way backwards. Uh, you just finished a, a roundtable conversation around the supply chain and unpacking that. How'd that go? Yeah, it was really good. I uh, opened my eyes a little bit too. I mean, I, I think I mentioned this yesterday, but supply chain kind of inventory management, optimizing purchasing is, is for me, that was like one of the big themes of the conference. So this was a great way to end. Um, so, you know, Corey from um, Fisk, Corey Borkart from Fisk Electric was on and, and Chad um, with the clays from uh, Applied Software. So uh, it was it was pretty interesting. Uh, Corey had mentioned something that really resonated with me, but, you know, we were talking about, or they were talking about material prices and copper and PVC in particular, everybody knows the pain with those and how to purchase, but, you know, he was pointing out that it's actually often the little items that are the real problem. So he gave an example of a particular GFCI being hard spec in a hospital. And I mean, you, you literally, you can't power up the building unless you could get that, those GFCIs and they're, they're out, they're out of stock. There, there's no supply of them. And that actually being a much bigger problem for, for them than, you know, copper, you can, it costs more, but you, yeah. can, you can still procure it. For something like that, that gets hard specced in and you have to use a particular breaker. Um, and he mentioned anything with like a chip in it. Those are the real risks. And I think the whole com- the whole panel talked about, you know, wh- where, who, where does that risk lie? If it's a product that cannot be procured, that is hard spec into the building. Whose responsibility is that for delays, schedule delays, uh, especially for something that's got potentially penalties in the contract? And yeah, you know, we kind of opined on potential new uh, legal, um, basically the case law that's going to get established as a result of the supply shortage. And you know, these are things I hadn't thought about before. It was really interesting that you know, thinking about little items that actually are the the bigger problems if they're critical to. For example, turning the power on. Right. Uh, so <laughs> it's pretty critical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so there was the electrical and the mechanical perspective on that round table. Did they approach it in a different way or was there any differences or were they pretty similar on the same page? I, I think the, the general theme of getting a model that's got more content, uh, detailed content to do purchase orders and bombs and really material forecasting um, both of them was was you know critical. The uh-huh. more detail that can get into that model prior to construction gives them more visibility into the the supply chain or you know future supply demand to meet the project. So that was a theme that was definitely definitely shared across both. I think um, you know, Corey Tork talked about keeping their fab shop busy. Something they used to do in the past would to be to build. Um, certain assemblies that they know they're going to need in the future. So they might not need them on this job, but if they have a, mm-hmm. a slack in their in their demand at uh, in their fab shop, they just build known assemblies. 
And he said, you know, with material pricing today, that actually isn't possible. You can't just go and, and buy, you know, copper and start building things because you don't want to end up with a really, um, you know, an overpriced inventory, basically, for the yeah. job you're trying to bid. And, and that, I think, at least from his standpoint, was something that was really unique to his electrical contracting business. And that, that one really, you know, really had me thinking, too. We, again, we talked about digitization of vendor you know, inventory, supply management. And um, it just feels like, you know, maybe this is the hot topic because we're going through all these supply shortages right now, but it really felt like this is the pressing issue in the, in this whole conference. I heard this come from so many different angles over the last yeah. few days. So that's interesting too, when you're pairing it with the the push of industrialized construction and really trying to get ahead of all that stuff, but you're, you can't. Right. Right. It's, it's so actually, big catch 22. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a blocker to doing more prefab when you have such volatility in the, in the price of materials. And, you know, if you went and bought copper today or PVC and had to, and we're prefabbing just to, you know, to build up some inventory, you might end up with inventory uh, material inventory that you can't win the next job on because it costs too much. And yeah. uh, so you really get into this commodities, you know, you have to really get into you know, really inventory optimization. How do you cost your inventory and how do you use that as a, as a, a way to win bids? You know, can you buy low and, and win bids having that or, and avoid um, stocking up on materials that are overpriced. And the, the other, now I'm remembering one of the other little nuggets I didn't consider is um, I think it was Chad talking about it, but his suppliers aren't stocking things either, like the dis distribution. So, you know, you go <laughs> step up the supply. It's just chain. compounding the problem. <laughs> yeah, so they don't want to put a bunch of copper on their shelves that yeah. is uh, way more expensive than it's going to be in, in two to three months. So, you know, you don't you don't just go back to your supplier and solve the problem. It's like it's this it has this ripple effect all the way up the up the chain, which is pretty interesting. Did they get into timelines on on when they think things will? start to kind of settle down? Corey talked about that. I think his perception was copper and PVC will be solved one way or the other. Um, mm -hmm. And the chip shortage is going to be here a lot longer than anybody anticipated. And, um, you know, it, other industries that I've been part of, that seems to be the general perception. Um, chip shortage is, is going to be something that's going to sting for a while. Um, that's not that one doesn't isn't a problem of just cranking up supply it's not so easy with the um kind of the global supply chain of chips so right they were pretty worried about that that piece and i think you know a lot of industries are from auto to semiconductor you know all the computer companies and uh yeah. you know think about how many chips go into a building today <laughs> versus <laughs> even 10 years ago you know and you know there's a lot of smart components that have that re, you know are tied to the global chip supply chain which right that's a real risk yeah that connectivity is <laughs> the you know it's it's been such a big craze over the, the last few years of, of pushing it more and more and getting more things connected but then you have something like this and what <laughs> yeah. do you do then <laughs> yeah yeah and uh that one's i think it's gonna take a while to to uh, ramp that up, you know, it's part of the infrastructure bill, right? I mean, building more yeah. cap capability um, here in the U.S. to to make chips. So, uh, unfortunately, those plants, uh, Intel doesn't just crank out five new uh, fab chip fab plants. <laughs> <laughs> It would be nice, a couple but, months. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we get back to the same problem. This is like now you got to go build fab plants, and you can't build them because you don't have the chips to build them. Right. And, it's uh, right. yeah, it's a nasty spiral, Todd. <laughs> That's right. Well, one of the other uh, roundtables that was happening at that same time was was one that I actually got to to serve as a a panelist on, um, and it was a, a topic near and dear to my heart. The the people on the podcast have heard me harp on this and get on my soapbox quite a bit, but it's the the, the marketing problem that exists in construction, and uh, one of the big things that we were talking about is the frankly, the need for like a, an industry-wide PR campaign, like what the military did a, a while back in hmm. and make construction cool again <laughs> and show it all as a, a viable option instead of just having it as a, a job that you're, you know, stereotypically swinging the hammer the rest of your life, show all the 
options and the, the career paths and the opportunities that exist in construction and the tech and the innovation that's happening in this space is really needed. And so we were unpacking, you know, when did construction become uncool and, and what are some small things that we can do and big things that we can do as an industry to, to help address this problem? Because you, know, you have the supply chain issue, but you also have the, the skilled labor shortage that everybody's tired of talking about. So it was a really yeah. interesting conversation. That, that's another one you don't solve overnight. You no. know, it's, uh, um, I, you know, one of the things that bothers me about that conversation is, is it's always like a college or trades. And I think a lot yeah. of people don't realize that, you know, most of the skilled trades apprenticeship programs actually do come with a college credits. And, you know, if you go through most of the UA training, for example, is actually tied to a local community college, you get a college education you know, you get college credits for going through the apprenticeship, right? And you're getting paid while you're doing it, and you know, and you're learning a, a pretty uh, viable skill. But it isn't like I hate when people say it's either college or or construction because you can go into the construction path and get a college degree and get paid to do it, get paid for your degree, and get paid while you're getting your degree. And yeah. it isn't like college or construction. It's this is like the secret both that I don't think people talk about it that way. And it, I see it on LinkedIn all the time. It drives me nuts. Oh, you know, this guy went to college. <laughs> this guy went into construction. I'm like, yeah, no, that guy got a college education too. You, you idiots. It's, just, <laughs> it's, it's even better than it seems on. Uh, right. Yeah. But I don't know if you guys talked about that at all, but that's my like pet peeve. No, that's a great point. You should, <laughs> uh, we, we didn't dive into the, it, it can be the, the both and uh, we centered a lot around the awareness of it, of just talking about it. You know, the, construction has been so passive in letting other people kind of define the narrative of what the construction industry is and, and what you do in construction that, that as a whole, uh, construction doesn't take ownership of telling the stories of what's happening. And, and when they do, they're telling the, the big flops and failures. And that's an easier story somehow to, for construction to share than the more positive, like this was a success, this was a win. So we were unpacking, well, why is that? Is it stem from the kind of humility aspect in construction that mm. you don't really want to brag? You, you want to, you know, build the building, get your work done and, and move on to the next project. Or is it something else entirely? Is it that people just aren't good storytellers or, uh, you know, then we, we dove into a little rabbit trail of, don't position yourself as the the hero of the story. You're you're the guy that, of the story. Nobody cares about what you particularly do. It's, it's what can you do for somebody else? And so listen to their pain points and frame your story and your narrative to what they're talking about and, and thinking about. So um, it was it was a pretty wide <laughs> ranging conversation. The military um, parallel is interesting. Of course, it's a little easier to do things with a cent cent you know centralized command. But is there an equivalent to that? that the construction industry sees? Is there a, you know, a jointly funded marketing campaign? I think that it's almost the scale it would take is, yeah. you know, for example, the entire um, trade, all trade organizations come together and saying, look, let's put some money into promoting this. I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if there's anything even under underway on that level. Um, well, that was one of our stumbling blocks that, that we kept coming back to is, is who, who takes the lead yeah. in in that whole effort that's a big undertaking and who takes the lead in that and so um you know travis Foss was one of the people on on the panel he has the construction dorks podcast and they do great things uh and so having kind of those voices around creating the awareness that's a, a factor in it um brandon patterson i don't know if you're familiar with him but he's a uh, with the iowa skilled trades hey amy <laughs> How's it going? From United Club. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Glad you could join us. <laughs> Thank you. Only for a few minutes because I have to go catch my flight, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to say thank you for an incredible event. <laughs> well, thank you for, for being a part of it, for sure. Amy, we've just been here kind of fumbling around, not knowing what to say. So thank you for finding <laughs> some structure. I'm not sure I'm going to help that right. situation. <laughs> but we know the team is back now. 
<laughs> you dil diligently watched all of the sessions today. We're looking forward to your. Uh, oh, uh, excellent. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Just me <laughs> racing through the airport. <laughs> so we were just talking about how to make construction cool again and bring people into the industry that maybe have it given construction a, a fair look or, or shake or have a misconception it's about it's it. It's already cool. Like it doesn't right? have to be cool again, right? The people who are in it love it. I have to say like some of the people True. who yeah. I've been working with, like they just get it. And, and I think that the sad Bad thing is, is that the skilled trades doesn't seem sexy to the next generation because I don't think we've taken the time to kind of market to um, the next generation. And I think, you know, I, one of the projects that we worked on with a couple of the unions um, was about, uh, and actually a couple of the, J, uh, the junior colleges in uh, Northern California was how do we, it's not just about the training, right? We wanna get people into training, but even before that, how do we tell the story of what it's like to be a tradesperson mm -hmm. and the incredible um, skill and nuance that it takes and the incredible technology that is coming that is going to support this next generation. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is something that we're, we're, you know, all in the industry certainly thinking about, um, and 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 then also finding ways, which we touched on a little bit yesterday, of, of knowledge capture because you have these incredible, you know, artisans who have been doing this for years, and we don't want them to retire without sharing their wealth of knowledge. And I think that's another aspect that um, you know, immersive technology in particular can be helpful with. Um, actually, wearing one of these devices. Uh, um, you know, capturing exactly how something is completed and then using that for training to sort of train this next generation. And um, yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an exciting time. We just, we're not doing a good job marketing it. Yeah, I agree. And it's bringing in Angie Simon and the keynote today, you know, she shared about what she's doing with, you know, partnership with SmackNet as well on helping to, to reach out to the next generation and and bring in a, a more diverse uh crew into the the industry uh amy uh, wondering uh, from your vantage point how you know you were just talking a, a little bit about it there but how do, do you really convince and create that kind of compelling narrative of this is the industry to to be in for people that may not have uh really given construction a second. Yeah, I mean, Angie said it clearly, right? We need more women and minorities coming into construction. And um, yeah. yeah, I yeah. mean, yeah, how does, how do we do that, Amy? Well, I think it's, 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 you know, every woman, you know, I've, I've, I'm have a big fan of Amy Marks, as you know, we talked about her last night at, at the event, um, you know, being able to see um, people of color, being able to see women, being able to see people across like, you know, every walk of life um, and, and then having those, you know, people that, that others can identify with, right? It, it, it's, it's much easier when you see someone who you admire or who, you know, you relate to in one way or another, um, you know, kind of blazing that, that path. And so I think, you know, things like Bridging the Gap podcast and having this information and having these events where you have a diverse group of people. I mean, I can't tell you how many um, really amazing uh, kind of diverse guests that we've had on the podcast as, as have you taught. And I think we just, you know, we need to do more of that, but, but actually at the, you know, kind of high school and the trades level, uh, we worked on a, a project um, uh, around welding, like teaching welding um, in virtual reality. And, you know, we took it to high schools and, they freaked out like they, they thought you know, like it just it gave this whole new perspective on what it, and actually how incredibly hard it was by the way you do not want me welding any of the bridges like, just <laughs> do not do not let me do that because it's gonna end in tears um but in i'm any right case, there with you don't feel bad <laughs> oh my god and i've I, like i failed my uh the driving the jet bridge as well to the plane to, that's actually really hard like we take it for granted like you get off the plane like someone's driving that's actually hard to do without a break in the plane. Anyway, that's not the point. That'd the point be bad is too. Don't that. Break a plane. Yeah, well, I'm certainly not going to break one I'm about to get on. <laughs> <laughs> that's the beauty. That's the beauty of all this training and in, in virtual environments. You can uh, learn what you're good at and what you're not good at, which is sometimes more important. That, uh, but that I think program that, you know, that yeah. 
the, the program that Allied, you know, uh, Angie's company um, and um, Hermanson put together that, you know, that was pretty inspirational. So they brought in the high school kids for a, I guess they called it an internship, um, but, you know, they had them go and they, you know, soldered copper and they bent sheet metal and they, you know, it was a diverse group of high school kids. And, you know, her vision was to try to roll that out to, I think she said, you know, 40 companies who did an internship like that. Uh, or they, they called it a camp. That's what it was. Yeah, like summer camp. Summer camp. So yeah. you know, for high heavy school metal kids. summer camp. Yep. And they like, opened up their and, shops. And they're like, I love Wait it. a minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Where's Iron you know, Maiden? I, I think I signed up for the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. So Western Western Ally and uh, Angie's company and Hermanson both opened up their shop and they ran a summer camp for uh, high school kids to come in and and they didn't just you know sit around and learn about BIM or whatever. They actually got in Seems there and. Not. Yeah, they did. They did soldering. They cut copper, soldered it. They they folded. Uh, you know, the bench sheet metal to build a little toolbox, like that. That to me is gonna grab some kids that didn't think about getting into the yeah. trades and say, "Holy cow, this is this is kind of cool. I can use my hands, and and you know, create and and innovate in a whole industry career that I didn't even know existed. Like, you know, how many high school kids even know what a mechanical contractor does? You know, and so yeah. I, I thought yeah. that was a great hack to try to help solve these problems. And congratulations to Angie. And for being com companies should should invest in sponsoring these types of programs, municipalities. Um, you know, you mean a lot of the, the at the state level and at, at the city level, there are a lot of programs. Uh, you know that not only sort of support local businesses and local industry. Uh, because they don't want companies leaving, but we have to think of this next generation workforce. And it's there's it's a simple thing to do. It's not that expensive to have these events where you are showing the art of the possible to the next generation. And by the way, everybody wins, right? If right. you if you connect with just a handful of those kids and they go into the trades and they become your next workforce. I mean, that is money well spent for companies, um, you know, who are thinking about, you know, what, what transformation is transformation, you know, isn't always about technology. It's the human factors are, are changing pretty dramatically and you can't lose sight of that. And at the end of the day, technology is still about human factors. It's all yeah. about human factors. Oh, for sure. I liked one of the things that Angie said, uh, you know, they had, I think like 30 or something kids go through the, the summer camp. And she said, if only even two or three end up in the trades, she considers it a big win. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, such a great perspective on it that you don't, you're not going to yeah. get all 30 of those into yeah. the trades, but even exposing them and then they're going to go home and, and tell their friends and, and family, Hey, this was, this was actually pretty cool. I, I didn't know that you could do this in the trades or, um, you know, I, I think that that ripple effect becomes a tsunami eventually. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So my, um, plane is boarding and it is one that I did not drive the jet bridge into. Yes. So I feel yeah. like it's okay for me to get on it. <laughs> Safe travels, but, um, Amy. Thanks so yeah, much for thank, dropping thank by. Thank you guys for for having me. It was really fun, and what a fantastic event! Um, and get to get actually to meet everybody IRL last night was was really exciting. So thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks. Safe Amy. travels, Amy. Take care. Bye. So long. So one of the the other kind of themes, Jake, that that Angie kind of pulled was talking about the the past challenges throughout the last 20 years that the, the industry has faced, you know, starting back from 9-11 and then the, yeah, I like uh, that. Yeah. yeah I, I thought it, that was a really cool of uh, an inspiring message kind of wrapped up of we've gone through stuff before we've gone through hard times before, but construction continues to, to rise up. Yeah. It was, and I think the way she framed it was kind of interesting taking those ups and downs uh, to, you know, optimize the ups to, to uh, really optimize your your processes, she talked about learning how to become lean and mean as a contractor. Mm -hmm. And you know you need to on the upswings, you need to focus on that so you can you're there for the downswings. You know where you can lean out. You know where you can, you know when you know a decent amount of your backlog dries up. Uh, how do you keep your business viable, indestructible? One might say. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I think that's a very points to real... Gryffindor for uh, <laughs> weaving in the theme. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think that's a very 
real strategy that needs to happen to think about indestructible long-term businesses. You can't be worried too much. I mean, you have to focus on making profit on the jobs you're on today. But if you're not looking at optimizing processes and figuring out how to become lean or know where you can lean out, um, you can't, if you don't think about that during the times of rest or the, the good times, you're not going to be able to act fast enough when, right. when the, the floor drops out. Well, it's and that too was late. A, yeah, that was, it starts turning down. She said that pretty directly. And, and I thought it was, you know, it was a, a message that's probably good to hear because depending on what you're what sector you're in right now, a lot of people, this is a good time right now. You know, you, you can't, there's plenty of construction work, but mm -hmm. you know, what, what's around the corner and are people taking this opportunity to lean out their business now, even though it doesn't seem like you need to right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lean out when the, the risk is smaller, obviously there's always risk, but you know, if you're leaning out while you're going in a, in a bit of a nosedive, the risk is, a lot higher. A lot harder. You to don't do it right. Yeah. 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 A lot harder to know where to cut back and where to, you know, where you've got uh, ability to be aggressive. So, uh, yeah, she's and she's been through. She's spoke with authority. I mean, she lived. Sent. You know, she talked through 9/11 and everything that the industry's gone since then, and that was a really good. I enjoyed that history trajectory and what it meant to her business. Yeah. Nice. Uh, any other takeaways from her talk or? MVP force in, in general as we we start landing our our plane as Amy's plane takes off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean the, the other piece she talked about was prefabrication and just the need to de-risk parts of their business by learning how to prefabricate, um, both from a safety standpoint and you know uh, variability standpoint on job sites. So it, that that's certainly a conference theme, Todd. We've, we've heard that from you know, nine different angles in this, in this talk uh, yeah. or in the, in the three days in the course of the, the conference. So I don't think that was a surprise. Um, I think after hearing a lot of different people talk about prefabrication, it isn't a one, it isn't a silver bullet. And I think right. that's what we're, you know, like we mentioned, Corey well, it's not a destination. I think yeah. that's where people <laughs> get tripped up. They think, Oh, I'm prefabbing, you know, yeah, I'm done. accomplished. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's there's a lot that goes into that. And that's a it's a complicated process of continual improvement. You're, it's it's not a you know, it's not a destination. It's a it's a journey for sure. Yep. Yep. So it was a, a good three days. You guys pulled together some fantastic materials and uh excited to go back and watch some of these that uh I missed or was double booked on. So um I'm, yeah. I'm sure over soon that'll all they'll all be available. Is that true? true statement yeah all the all the classes will be available on demand today's will be available tomorrow but by the time people are listening to this podcast they should be up and and running um available on demand so yeah we we took um at data we took the conference materials and have added them to your data project so if you uh everybody here at the conference uh got a free data license you can log in and search for any of those conference materials, uh, presentation materials, those are all available now as well. And of course, um, Todd and the Applied Software team would love more feedback forms filled out. We have a whole bunch of them. So thanks to everybody who did that. But I'm sure the more data you have on how this conference went, the better the next one gets. So um, absolutely, anyway, that's still open for anybody who has time to go in and complete another feedback form. Awesome. For those that don't know the the, the structure or the the logic behind it, what do you mean that you can search the the slide decks and everything? So we, uh, you know, Dato is a search engine. Effectively, we typically are used on project documents, like drawings and specs and submittals and RFIs. Um, but Dato can search anything. So we've taken the conference materials and added them in there as documents, effectively. And somebody can come in and just type in a search like, um, you know, prefabrication, electrical prefabrication, mm -hmm. and any of the conference materials that talked about prefabricating in electrical shops will, will, will show up as search results and you can access them. You can download them. You can, you can save them and share them. So um, the same as you would have an experience of searching through project documents, you can search through the conference materials, um, all the same powerful search and filters and everything are available. Very cool. Awesome. Well, Jake, thanks so much for being a part of MEP force on this podcast and big thanks to, to Dato for, for helping 
make this a, a successful event. Hey, it was all you guys. Uh, nice work. It's been a pleasure to be part of it and looking forward to uh, more of these in the future. Thanks, Todd. Sounds good. Now it's time for me to go home and, and sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> <All right. laughs>